All right, hello everyone. It looks like it's 6.30, so I will go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Katie Silk. I am the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library. And I'm excited to talk to you today about using your InfoSoup library card for genealogy research. Um, I just have a few quick announcements before we begin. Um, first, I wanted to let you know about our upcoming Find Your Ancestors presentations. They're genealogy presentations that we do every month. Um, our next one is going to be this Saturday, and it's going to be on proving and disproving family stories. And it's going to be with Gina Philbert Ortega, and that's at 2 o'clock on Saturday. And then we have one in two weeks on the 23rd about using alternative resources. Um, in February, we're going to talk about deciphering foreign language records, and in March, we're going to talk about World War II genealogy. And the links to register for all of those programs are going to be in your handout, um, which I posted a link in the chat for you guys. Um, I also wanted to encourage you guys to sign up for our local history and genealogy newsletter, which there's also a link to do that in the handout. Um, I send out about once a month or so, um, just some programs, services, different database tips and things, um, like I said, about once a month or so, sometimes less depending on what's going on. Um, if you need more help or in-depth things even after today's presentation um, you, on how to navigate any library databases or if you need help in your genealogy research and you have questions, feel free to email me. My email is on the screen as well as in the handout. And I wanted to let you know to check out our YouTube channel for recordings of our past programs. And again, the link is in the handout. And this program is being recorded, so it will be on YouTube probably tomorrow. Um, so during today's presentation, if you guys could keep yourself muted, that'd be great so that everyone can hear me speaking. Um, there is a handout that I posted a link in the chat. Um, for those who might have come late, I will post it again um, towards the end. Uh, if you want to, Type any questions you have in the chat box, feel free to do that as I'm talking. Right now, as I'm talking, since I can't um, screen share and do the chat at the same time, I won't be able to see your questions till the end. Um, so just type any questions you have and I'll, I'll answer them as best as I can at the end of the presentation. All right, so as long as you guys are ready to get started, we can dive right into learning how to use your InfoSoup library card for genealogy research. So first, I want to um, briefly talk about what is the InfoSoup card. So InfoSoup is a consortium of public libraries in the Northeast Wisconsin area, primarily in the Outagamie and Wapaka counties. Um, but we do have a lot of libraries in our system that are all throughout the state. Um, there is a listing of what libraries are in the InfoSoup um, consortium. Um, and I will show you briefly. There is a link in your handout. Make sure you guys can see this now, sorry. And um, here is the listing for uh, all of the, the libraries in the directory. And if you go to this link, um, each of these are all clickable links and then you can get to the website of each of these individual libraries. If it's been a while since you've used your card, it might be expired. Um, they do expire every year. So you can give us a call to get that updated and make sure that you can use it for all of the databases and putting materials on hold. Um, I have our phone number listed there as well as in the handout. So if you don't have an InfoSoup card, as long as you're a Wisconsin resident and you live in the state of Wisconsin, even part of the year, even if you're a snowboard, um, you can get an InfoSoup library card no matter where you live in Wisconsin. And right now with the library being closed thanks to the pandemic, um, what we are doing is we're doing remote registration via our website. And I have the link in the handout um, that will direct you there. You just want to go to infosoup.org and then under my library, there's a button that says new card registration. So that's the one that you're going to click on and fill out the form and then we'll connect with you to get a real library card number. After you fill out the new card registration, it just gives you a temporary card number. Um, so it doesn't quite work for all the databases and all the things that you need. We need you to prove your address, make sure that you really do live in Wisconsin, and then we'll get you a real card and a real card number that will work. I also quickly want to talk about the Wisconsin collection, which is our physical collection in the library. 
Um, so we have lots of books, journals, government documents, historic photos, of course, microfilm of the newspaper. Um, we have a pamphlet file that's all different subjects from all over the state, yearbooks, study directories, flat books, and lots of maps. Um, so if you're able to visit us at a time when we are open to the public, we encourage you to check out the Wisconsin collection. We also have materials in the Wisconsin collection that do check out. Um, so you can always put a hold on those through the Info Soup catalog. And since the library is not even open, how do you get the genealogy stuff right now? Well, each of the Info Soup libraries is currently kind of doing their own thing. Um, so you want to check with each library to verify if they're open and if they're closed or if they're offering curbside or any other ways to access the library materials. For Appleton, um, right now we're just doing curbside pickup and close to the public, um, but you would place materials on hold first through our catalog. And then once um, you get that notice that those materials are ready for you, you go to our website and fill out the curbside request form or give us a call and then schedule a time to come pick them up right from our parking lot. And um, even though I mentioned all those awesome things in the Wisconsin collection, not everything can be checked out, unfortunately, like the directories, the yearbooks. Since we only have one copy of them, we, we can't check them out to people. Um, but if at this time you have any questions, you need something looked up, you can definitely give us a call at the reference desk um, if you need something looked up quickly. If you have a huge list of things to look up, we're not kind of able to do that. Um, you just have to kind of make a list and wait till we reopen, hopefully soon. So how do you even get the stuff from home since we're all stuck at home right now? Well, you use your library card, of course. So that's what you guys are pretty much here for today is how to uh, learn how to use your library card from home to access all the cool genealogy. So there's two ways to do it. Um, the first way is through the InfoSoup website. Um, so there's this handy little list um, that's the local history collections through all the InfoSoup libraries. So this list, um, it's a link also in your handout, is going to give you a bunch of different links all over our website um, to a bunch of indexes we have, a bunch of databases we have, um, some search terms that you can use to try to find the local history and genealogy stuff in our catalog, as well as links to some of the libraries that have collections on their website that are for local history and genealogy. I will tell you though, this site does not include everything that we have. So another great place to go for all of the complete listings of the databases that we have is going to apl.org, which is the Appleton Public Library's main website. So once you get to apl.org, you're going to go where it says e-library. Um, so when you hover over it, you can see there's four different options. So there's quick list, which gives you an A to Z listing of all the databases we have. Full description is going to still give you that A to Z listing, but it's going to give you a little paragraph about each database so you know what it's used for. The APL created ones are, are databases that us librarians have created. And they're also, all the ones that we've created are also in that A to Z listing, so you don't need to worry about that. BadgerLink will take you directly to the statewide resources that we get um, through the program called BadgerLink. Um, so basically, if you're a Wisconsin resident, you have access to a certain amount of subscription services for free just by being a Wisconsin resident. So today I'm going to show you the quick list. Um, so like I said, it's an A to Z listing of all of the databases. Um, be aware that the numbers do change as we add in, and get rid of databases. Um, and then I'm also going to show you under full descriptions what it looks like. Quick. So here is a little paragraph about each of them. And then you can also list by subject. So there is one for genealogy. And then you just click on genealogy and hit apply. So the first database I'm going to talk about today is probably one that you guys are familiar with. It's Ancestry.com Library Edition, which right now is thankfully available from home. Usually um, it's only available in the library. But thankfully, Ancestry realized that since so many of the libraries are closed and people still want to use this time to do a lot of genealogy research, they've kindly provided remote access from home using your library card. I do want to let you guys know that if you don't have a permanent card number, so say you fill out that 
new card registration, it's going to give you a temporary number that starts with 873. That number, unfortunately, does not work to access Ancestry.com. You need to have a, a real library card number. Um, so you want to give us a call as soon as possible to get a real library card number so that you can access this database. And right now, it's available until the end of March from home, but they keep extending it. So hopefully, fingers crossed, they'll keep extending it yet this year. So now we're going to go into the database and I'll show you a little bit about what it looks like. So when you get to the info soup um, part where it, it asks you to sign into Ancestry Library Edition, it's first going to ask for your library card number. I'm going to pause my screen share for just a second while I type in my library card number. And I'll be right back. All right, so once you put in that library card number, it's going to bring you to this page and you just hit connect to Ancestry Library Edition. So this looks a little bit different um, compared to if you have a subscription to Ancestry.com, but there is still a lot of similar things um, that they do have. Um, so one of the things I'm going to show you first is just how to do a basic search. So right here, there's this nice big green button that says begin searching. So if you're not really sure where to start, that might be a good spot to start. And you see right away, you wanna put in a first name, last name, uh, maybe a place where they might've lived, a birth year. There's also some more options here that you can, you can put. You can add events like a marriage date, a death date, um, any type of event. You can add family members, you can search by keyword, by gender, all these different options. Um, so, you really want to play around with how you're going to search though. You don't want to fill out all of this information because it's going to narrow down all of your searches that you're going to have. So if you fill out everything, it's probably going to give you zero results, unfortunately. So you kind of need to play around a little bit about how you're going to search. So I say kind of start a little bit broader with maybe just a name and maybe like a, a birth year. So say like 1800 and then hit search. And we'll see what kind of results we get. So obviously right away you get 30,000 results. That's a little overwhelming. But what you can do is you can come over here and you can filter down the results. You can decide, hey, I'm only going to look at census records. Oh, or oh, I really wanna find out when he was born or when he got married or when he died. You can narrow it down over here. So if you click on these little arrows, it brings you even further down that you can narrow down. You can also play with these filters. So this means broad, and then the further you go to the right is the more exact that search is. Um, so you wanna kinda use the exact sparingly, just because if you put everything exact, it's going to only return things that are exactly that. And it might be too exact to you know, not give you any results. So we can kind of see what that looks like. Like see, it only took a few results away. So once you find something you wanna look at, you can definitely click on where it says in blue right there or where it says view image. So we're just gonna look at this one just for fun. When you first come to view the image, it's gonna give you like a little index kind of preview of who was on the record, what age they were, some details that are, are in the record. If you look further down, it's gonna give you a source a source citation. That's very important to write down before you even go to look at the record. And then the source information below that is basically where Ancestry.com got that information. So here it says, originally it came from Ontario, Canada's select marriages from the archives of Ontario, Toronto. Another really helpful thing that you wanna do before you even go to look at the record is look at this description and see a little bit more about this record set. Once you decide, hey, it's probably my person, let me look a little bit further and analyze the record. You can click view again, and then it will pull up an actual image of the record. So you can move your mouse all around to kind of scroll up and down. Um, you can zoom in and zoom out over here on the side. Do whatever you need to do to look at that image. Once you decide that, hey, it's, it's definitely your ancestor and you wanna save it, up here in the corner, there's a green save button. So what you can do is you can either send the image home 
which um, pulls up something that says, oh, you can email it. So you would put in your email, confirm your email, and then send it, and it's going to send it to you as an email. You could also just save it directly to your computer. I definitely recommend you save everything that you find because you never know when Ancestry is going to take away access of this record set. And obviously, right now, we only have Ancestry at home, but in the future, they're going to probably push it back to just being library only. So you definitely want to save all of the images that you come across so you have them for the future. And of course, being sure to write down a source citation where you got it from. So we're going to go back out to the main part of the site again. And I just wanted to show you a couple other things. Um, they do have some blocks here if you want to narrow down and only search in the census or only search vital records. Um, one of the other big things that people use Ancestry Library Edition for is the public member trees. And you can easily get to those right here under the quick, quick links. So once you click on that, it's only going to search in those public member trees. So again, you'd put in a name of somebody and maybe a birth or death or marriage record. I'm just putting a random person. Well, Richard Warren is actually my Mayflower ancestor, but I don't know all of his information off the top of my head. But then you can see all of these results are trees of people who put their information on here. Of course, you don't know the accuracy of these trees, but these can be used as hints to help you with your research. So you'd look at the information about um, who their spouse is, what their birth date and locations are, and try to find actual records to support those and see if they match your ancestor. Just because it's the same name does not mean that it's the same person. Um, so right here, you can also see that there's certain attached records and photos. Just because it's a super source tree does not mean it's accurate either because some people like to just attach stuff and then not even pay attention if it's, if it's the right person or not. Um, so what you can do is you can click into their tree and see kind of what things they've attached and, and use those sources to figure out if it's your ancestor that it's really who you are searching. Unfortunately, the one downfall of Ancestry Library Edition is that you can't contact this person. Um, you'd need an actual paid subscription to Ancestry.com to be able to, to contact this person. Another thing I wanted to point out for Ancestry Library Edition is their card catalog. Um, so to find that, you go under this search box and go down to card catalog. So as you can see, there's just over 10,000 records in Ancestry Library Edition, which is just a fraction of what Ancestry.com really has. Um, but the card catalog will give you a searchable list of all collections that they have. So say you really only want to look for your Wisconsin ancestors right now. Over here in the title or the keyword box, you can just type in Wisconsin, and hit search, and then it's going to pull up all of the Wisconsin-based collections. And then once you click in here, you can search directly just in that collection. So again, you'd want to, you know, read some of the information here and see, is it something that I think my ancestor is going to be in or not? Another really cool thing that I think Ancestry has is some charts and forms that you can download for free. Um, so they have ancestral charts, they have research calendars, um, correspondence records, family group sheets areas to write down what sources you have. So definitely download those. Those are for free. And under their learning center, they have a lot of really cool things as well. Um, so they have some research tips and aids, um, like census tips, search tips, things like that. And I also really like this map feature that they have. Um, so it just covers the United States for now. Um, but if you click on a state, it will give you a bunch of different links to like research guides for that state or um, where to write for vital records or where to find census records and land records. So each of these things that you click is going to bring you out to a wiki with information. So this is the Roots Web Wiki. So this is a really helpful source um, to help you navigate how to research in this area. That. 
So that's pretty much what I wanted to show you for Ancestry um, for right now. I do have some search strategies. So like I said, you want to use the card catalog. It's your friend. You really want to search more so in the individual records instead of doing that big wide search because sometimes that big wide search is going to be very overwhelming with 30,000 results. Um, if you know who you're looking for and where you're looking for them, it'll be easy to find what collections your ancestors are going to be in. It's also sometimes really helpful to browse through the records and not rely on the index because the index, of course, could be wrong. They could have misspelled um, a name, they could have used a, a nickname, they could have used initials. There's lots of different ways that your ancestor might be in that index. So sometimes just browsing through the records, if you know, hey, I know in 1940 that they lived in Oconto, why am I not finding them when I search their name? Well, if you go to that Oconto census in 1940, you can just page through all of the pages and then boom, you'll find them on page five. Um, like I said before, you kind of want to start broad with your search and try a couple different search ways. So start with more information, start with less information, try different searches. So you don't want to search with a death date of your ancestor in there if, you're, if you know you're looking for their birth record or their marriage record, because obviously their death date is not going to be on their birth record or their marriage record. So it's not going to be smart to search with that. And if you can, um, some of the collections do allow you to search without a name. So say you know for sure that this person was born on October 1st of 1940, and you cannot for the life of you find them in that collection. Well, instead of searching with their name, which might be misspelled or might be you know, an initial or something, Try searching just for October 1st, 1940 in that collection, and then you might be able to find them. Again, just a reminder to make sure you download the image, print it out, email yourself a copy. Even if you have an Ancestry.com membership, you want to make sure you're doing that because as soon as you stop paying for that membership, they will not let you access those records anymore. So you want to make sure that you're backing those up and saving a copy for yourself if you really want it. I also wanted to point out that the Ancestry.com Library Edition does not currently integrate with Newspapers.com Library Edition, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, so you need to use those separately right now. You can also do wildcard searching in Ancestry.com, um, as well as a couple other databases I'm going to show you tonight. So what wildcard searching is, is you can use an asterisk, which is the little star thing above the eight. Um, to replace any number of characters between 0 and 5. So, for example, if you have um, someone with the last name Christensen, and they might smell it multiple different ways, depending on who is writing it or how it sounds to the person who's being told to write it down. And people really didn't have a standardized spelling of their, their last name for quite a while. Um, so there's multiple different ways you can write Christensen. So, um, what you would do is you'd use the wildcard star at the end. And so as you can see in this example, if you put it after the N, it will search for Christensen with the S-O-N, with the S-E-N. It'll even um, search for Christians if maybe their last name got cut off a little bit. The other wild card you can use is a question mark. And that just replaces one character. Um, so for Smith, if you know, they misspelled it with a Y, or if they spelled it with an I, um, you'd want to replace just that one letter to get those results. But when you are searching with a wild card, you want to make sure that at least the first and the last character cannot be a wild card, and that all searches containing wild cards must have at least three non wild card letters. So there's an example here. Um, yes, you can have a wild card at the beginning, but if you put a wild card out here, it's not going to work. Yes, you can have a wild card at the end, but if you had it at the beginning as well, it's not going to work. And then say you only had a last name with four letters, well, you have to have at least three of those letters and then use the wild card. I also encourage you to check multiple sites for the same record, um, like use Ancestry.com and FamilySearch to find a census record, because you never know if the indexing may be better on one site. And also sometimes the records just look a lot better on one site. Um, for whatever reason, maybe the image that you were looking for was really blurry 
or cut off or crooked. Um, maybe at the other side it works, it looks way better. There are a couple books available in our collection that will help you with Ancestry.com if you're not very familiar with it, or even if you feel like you are familiar with it, I definitely still encourage you to check them out because you really learn how to use the site a lot. And there is a section on fold 3 and newspapers.com as well in the second edition of the unofficial guide to Ancestry.com. It is a few years old now, um, but it's still very, very informative and has a lot of information to help you really get the most of the site. And there's also an unofficial Ancestry.com workbook that's kind of a how-to manual for, for using the site and kind of encourages you a little bit more about how to use the site. Ancestry.com also has a really great support site that is available for free. Um, so I'll just show you that really quick. So you can first either search for answers or um, if you know that um, one of your questions is about like DNA or about ancestry trees or about the search function, these options at the top narrow down what their help fields are. So if you are like, oh, I need some search tips or, oh, I want some free charts or I need help finding records. There's all these different awesome tutorials and information about how to use their site. All right, the next one is Heritage Quest. Um, this one you do not need a library card to sign in for if you live in Wisconsin. Heritage Quest is owned by Ancestry. Um, so typically uh, when we are open to the public, um, Ancestry.com is available at the library and Heritage Quest is still available at home. Before we get into Heritage Quest, I did wanna point out that we do have a cool user guide. We also have a user guide for Ancestry Library Edition um, that is linked in your handout. But this is a little guide that I actually created that just walks you through a little bit more about how to use the site, um, how to search. So if you forget anything I cover today or need a little bit more help, you can definitely check that out. Or again, you could always reach out to me and our help do a little bit more one-on-one -on -one tutorial for you. There's also a Niche Academy tutorial, which is just a little short video showing you how to use the site. So you can click on that as well. But to get to it, you just click on go to resource and then it'll load. Um, so this has a lot of the same stuff that Ancestry.com has. It looks the same with that big green search button. So we're not gonna go into how to search and all that stuff. I just wanted to show that this is an option. Um, they have a lot of great stuff on here and a lot of really cool research aids and maps just like Ancestry.com has, but not quite the same. Um, I think a lot of their research aids are probably the same, um, but their maps thing, what is really cool about Heritage Quest, um, what I really like about it is it shows you the different boundaries and the years that they change. Um, so this is what Wisconsin looked like in 1820. And then in the white back here is showing you what it looks like now. So you can kind of click over here and see how the state kind of came to shape and how the different counties came to shape. So if you know, hey, your, your ancestors came here in 1860, well, this is what it looked like. Oneida County wasn't in existence. They, they probably were married in Marathon County then. So that's where you would look for those records. All right, the next one we're gonna talk about is Fold 3 Library Edition. And that is the military um, database, which um, Ancestry also owns. And again, we do have a little research um, user guide if you guys need it um, it's on your handout as well as linked right here. So you just go to the resource and then it's going to ask for your barcode again. So I'm going to pause just for a second while I type in my library card number. All right, so once you get that library card number in and hit sign in, this is the, the page that it brings you to. So as I said, Fold 3 is, is basically um, the military records only. So again, right here, the main search box is right here. 
you would search for a name. I typically put quotation marks around a name if I want it together, because then it's going to search for that name um, without searching for every instance of George and every instance of Hamilton. Then this has over 31,000 results, which is super overwhelming. But if you know that your ancestor was in a certain war, then you want to narrow down over here. So you can narrow down by conflict, you can narrow down by place, um, you can narrow down publication types, different things like that. Um, if you only want to look at their service records, for example, um, or if you really want a pension file. Um, so you can just narrow down here on the sign. It's also really helpful if you know what unit or regiment they were in. Um, if you kind of are starting with scratch, from scratch and you really don't know what it is, um, I will talk about in just a minute where um, some resources are that you can maybe find out what that unit or regiment is. Um, but once you find something that you think is your ancestor and you want to take a look at it, you just click on their name and it will bring you to the actual image of it. So again, over here, you can zoom in, zoom out. You can play with the brightness and contrast if it doesn't quite look right. You can download it. Um, you can even save it to your ancestry tree if you do have an ancestry tree. Um, lots of fun stuff. Also, um, when you're looking at these records, definitely make sure to look at the bottom where it shows you a film strip of the next records just to make sure that you're getting all the pages. Because sometimes it's not really obvious if it's just a one page document or if it's a five page document, you want to make sure you're getting all five pages. I personally don't love the search function of Fold 3. Um, so what I typically do is I typically browse through the collections. Um, so what you can do is you can go browse. And this brings you to the whole list of all of the different publications that Fold 3 Library Edition has, which of course is just a small subset of what you would get if you did subscribe to Fold 3. Um, but of course, you know, use all the free stuff that you can and then when they have a special, maybe sign up for a month worth and, and see what else you can find. Um, but over here, you, you could narrow it down to certain wars and then look in certain um, subsets. Over here, if you click on this little eye, it's going to give you a little bit more information about that record collection if it decides to load. Here we go. So over here, you can, you can get a little overview of what this record collection is and maybe determine, oh, this isn't gonna cover my ancestor or this really might cover my ancestor. And it also tells you if it's all completed, like this one's only 99% complete. So maybe in another month, you wanna check back and see, okay, my ancestor wasn't in it at that time, but maybe in a month, it'll be 100% completed. It also lets you know when it was published and last updated, which is sometimes important. This one hasn't been updated since 2014 and it's at 99%, so I'm gonna guess they're not gonna get it at 100% anytime soon. Um, but from here, then you can research um, your ancestor or their unit and then narrow down those results. And just like I did before, um, you can get that image, download it. Another really great, awesome resource that um, Fold3 is really working on is if you have a Civil War ancestor, they have a lot of really awesome Civil War stories about the different battles, the different regiments. You can really learn a lot about things. Um, so say the Battle of Corinth, I know one of my ancestors was in. Now it's going to bring you to, oh, that was the wrong one. The next one is the battle. So this is going to tell you exactly what happened in the battle, um, like how it came about, how many people were in it, over here, how many troops, who won, um, what days it happened, um, what the casualties and wounded were, all that stuff. And then you can search for a specific regiment that was in that battle. It also shows you the regiments here. So if you know like, oh, my ancestor was in this one, you could just narrow down and see, okay, what other battles were they in? Um, and then it will give you a little bit more information about like who was a part of that regiment. So that's really cool. To kind of help you learn a little bit more about that, what they did. There's also a memorial section. So they have the honor walls um, and a couple other memorials. And you can also create a memorial if one hasn't been created for your ancestor. And it's not working for me right now, but um, it's really 
nice to attach things to your ancestors on our wall um, and keep all of their records. Again, just like Ancestry.com, you want to make sure you're downloading those images and keeping it. Um, a couple of strategies. Um, be aware that it's not just for military ancestors. Even if your ancestor wasn't in a conflict or didn't um, participate, they still had to register for the draft. Um, they also have city directories, too, that non-military ancestors were in. They have um, newspapers and then this really cool like UFO sighting section of the website. You can really go down a rabbit hole and kind of see some weird stuff in Fold 3. Um, yes, there is overlap with Ancestry.com Library Edition because, of course, Ancestry owns both. Um, but there's also a lot of really great resources on Fold 3 that Ancestry does not have, um, particularly a lot of their war photos. Um, so you definitely want to check those out. And again, um, just like I said before, with the different images and maybe one's more clear on Fold 3, maybe they they indexed it better or maybe they scanned it a little bit better so it looks better on Fold 3. Worth a shot just to take a few minutes to look at that. Again, I don't feel like it's the greatest search function. Um, so you can go through and browse instead. That's a little bit easier. And it's best if you know the unit or the regiment. Um, if you don't, you can check their obituary. Um, sometimes they have a special tombstone that has what unit they were in or what war they were in. Um, other family sources, maybe maybe you have a discharge paper or a medal that they earned. Um, there's lots of different websites as well, um, like Civil War rosters. Just Google around or, or play around. Um, there's also a couple different search videos that you could do to learn a little bit more about Fold 3 and researching military ancestors. Again, you want to uh, experiment with the searches, try without the name. Just look at the regiment in their unit and see what else you can learn about that um, group of men that they fought with. You never know when your ancestor is going to be in that one. The next one we're going to talk about is family search. You don't need a library card for family search, of course. Um, family search is a completely free site, but I did want to let you know that we are an affiliate library as of last year. So what that means is that a small subset of records that are available on FamilySearch, you can only view if you view them at the FamilySearch library in St. Louis or Salt Lake City, or at a FamilySearch library, um, or FamilySearch center, or affiliate library. So you might get a little error if you try to view a record. Um, usually you see these little icons on FamilySearch, so the little document just means that it's an index and you wanna make sure that you follow up and try to find that original record that in, is indexed. The little camera means that there is an actual original document. So you wanna look at that original document. But if that camera has a little key like this one, that means it's a restricted image. So you might be able to view it at the library or at a family search center or a family search library. If you wanna um, copy down that link that you, cannot access from home, but you might be able to access from the library and then see if you can access it. Of course, right now we are close to the public, but our Wi-Fi does extend to the parking lot. So um, this is what Family Search looks like. Um, I do recommend creating an account because I feel like you get a little bit better results if you create an account. So always make sure that you're signed in with your account on Family Search. So to do a basic search, once you've signed in, you can go ahead and go to the search box. And there's a couple different options depending on what you want to search. If you want to search just records, if you want to search their family tree, just like Ancestry, they have a family tree. Um, there's also genealogies, books, they have a really awesome research wiki, and the catalog um, directs you to a lot of their different resources that they have both online as well as offline. Um, but just to do a basic search for the records that are available online, you want to go to search and records. So here you could either put in the information, um, again, making sure that you're not filling in everything and trying to experiment a little bit with those searches um, to see what kind of results you get. Otherwise, you can um, narrow down right away by location. Or if you know a specific collection name, like say you want to only search the 1940 census for that person, you would type in that collection name right there. One of the awesome things about um, searching by location 
is that they have these awesome resources over here. So there's these learning courses. So say you're not familiar with how to research in California. There's all these different videos and other things that they have that you can learn about how to research in California. And it also has a link to the wiki. So this will tell you all about how to research. And these are a lot of these are quick, quick clickable links where you can um, specifically find information about that different county or um, specific records that they have. Some of them are a little bit better than others. Um, so it just kind of depends and they're always updating them. And they're people who are professional genealogists that are updating them. So you can definitely trust them. So I'll show you quick just what a, a basic search looks like. So of course, it's going to ask you to sign in. So I'm just going to sign into my account first. Okay, right, so once you sign in, it's going to bring you to that results page. You could probably um, continue without signing in, but like I said, I feel like it's better if you do sign in. Um, so then over here, you can see like certain ones are just indexes, some of them, they have the images. If you see this little tree thing, it means it's attached to somebody in the family tree. Um, so you can go to that person and see if it's your ancestor or not. So again, this is just an index. It kind of gives you information about that person. This one is one that um, they don't have the images actually attached to the person, so you'd have to browse through the film. But these ones, if you want to just view the image, you just click on the image. And it brings you right to the image. You, you could download over here, you could print it. Um, again, you can zoom in and zoom out um, over here. If you needed to go to the next page or anything like that, um, down here is the index. So lots of awesome things. Um, also, if you click on information, it will give you a citation. It also gives you a citation of where you found the record um, on this index page as well. So if you would just click on the name over here, it brings you a separate window and right down here under document information, it gives you all the different fun things like what sheet number it was on, what household, and then this is the citation. I also wanted to show you um, the family tree quickly. So again, you wanna take this information with just a grain of salt because you don't know how accurate it is. Um, on family search, anybody can update or um, make corrections to the family tree. So that's one downfall of ancestry or not ancestry, but um, family search. So once you find somebody, um, what you can do is you can follow that person. And once you click on this follow button, you'll get notification then if anybody makes changes to it. So say somebody says, oh, that's not the right death, death date for this guy. Or, oh, no, he didn't die in this place in Michigan. He died in Florida. Then you'll get a notification that says somebody changed this. And usually when somebody changes it, they have to write a little reason about why they changed it. So maybe this person says, oh, I have this sex death record that I know it's for sure this person, that's why I changed it. Um, so what I typically do um, for the family tree is, is I don't so much rely on the information on here. I use it like as a hint to find actual records. But what I typically use this for is the sources. So right here, it directly links you to the sources. So you could click on view source and then go out to look at the actual source and make sure that it's your ancestor. Um, you could also see what kind of changes have been made. And you can see like this person um, attached a source. So you might want to contact this person. So you would could click on their name and send them a message. Um, otherwise, they might have their email address listed there that you could send them an email and connect with them because hopefully since they're making changes to your person, they might be related. Um, they could be a distant cousin researching. So that's really cool. And also under memories, um, if Sometimes people put photos of like obituaries or photos of the person, um, other types of documents maybe. Um, maybe they have like a family story on that person. So those are really helpful um, if you have a, a memory there of a person. 
I also wanted to show you the card catalog. Um, so again, under search, if you want to go to the catalog, this allows you to search either by place, by surname, by title, author, subject, keyword, even by call number or film number. Um, so sometimes Ancestry will give you like a film number that links you to a certain collection on Family Search. Or say um, you're looking for a specific um, resource in a specific county for your ancestor. So like Brown County, Wisconsin, I'll look it up. You would click on that, click search. And now this is going to bring you a listing of all of the resources that are from Brown County. So it's broken down by different little categories. Like if you expand it, it'll show you these are books that they have. Um, so you click on it and see like, oh, there's a digital version of this. You could click here and then look and see, oh, is my ancestor in there? Um, also, if it's not a digital version, um, it will tell you a little bit more about how to access it. Some of the stuff is only accessible at the Family Search Library, or you might have to page through um, one of the, the films um, in order to find it because it's not indexed yet. Or it might be a book that you can check out um, from a different library, things like that. I also wanted to quick show you that there's a, a Family Search community, so it's kind of like a little message board um, and a help site. So under this little question mark, it's kind of hidden. Um, but if you click on community, it brings you to the family search community. So this is where you can get support help. Um, you can also find groups that are researching similar things to you, or say you are researching your German ancestors and you have no clue where to begin. Well, there's a German ge genealogy research group and you can say, hey, how do I find my German ancestors? I mean, you want a little bit more detail than that, um, but these sites will help you. Um, there's one for events, there's one for Canadians, uh, there's tons, there's specific ones for families. Um, so you would just join that group and then you can post a message on there and people will respond. Um, I know some people even, like if they have foreign language documents, people will translate them, which is really helpful. So this is a really great part of Family Search. Also under the question mark, you can find the Family Search Wiki and other um, helpful things. Right. So I have a couple of search strategies for Family Search. Just like Ancestry.com, you can use those wild cards that we talked about, the, the star or the asterisk and the question mark. Um, there is a little box that you can check on the search box um, that says exact. So that's, again, going to make sure um, that it's an exact search. That's exactly how you want to spell it. So you want to use that really sparingly because it's going to limit down what results you have. And again, just like Ancestry, the more life events you add into that search box when you're doing that search, the narrower your searches are going to um, be. So you kind of want to start broad with maybe just a name, birth year, or birthplace, and then narrow down on the left-hand side where um, you're, you're searching. So then you don't have 30,000 results to go through. Uh, you also want to try to search in the individual collections, but make sure you're reading a description first of that collection to make sure that it's the right time, the right place. Um, like for example, I was looking at New York records and there's this really awesome collection on family search of, of New York births and baptisms for certain counties in New York. And so I read the description, I was like, oh darn, Onondaga County where my ancestors are from is not part of this collection. So I'm not even gonna bother searching that collection because I know that they're not gonna be in it if they were born in Onondaga County. There is so much on Family Search right now that is unindexed. So you want to make sure that you're exploring those unindexed collections, which to do that, you'd narrow down by the, the location and then um, you could click through and browse the images. Usually it's really, um, even if it's not indexed, it's really laid out nicely. Um, so like for census records, they have it listed by like cities and the different localities. Um, for like probates and wills, they usually have it like alphabetical or um, by year broken out, things like that. Um, so it's not like you're researching through 10,000 images 
you might have to kind of hunt and peck and, and try, okay, where am I at the hundred? Um, if it's an A to Z listing and there's uh, 3000 results and I know my last name starts with an S, I'm not gonna look at the hundreds. I'm gonna put it more towards like the 2000 and C. Are, am I close to the S's or am I still in the M's? Um, even if it's indexed and available on Family Search, you wanna make sure you're tracking down the original record because the index might not index everything that's on that record. So follow up as much as you can to find that original record. And if you don't find your ancestors in a certain collection, definitely check back in a few weeks or a few months because they're updating collections all the time. They're um, fixing the indexes as they can and they're just adding so much more all the time. Um, I also want to encourage you to not ignore the scanned books and the user submitted genealogies. Um, they have a ton of stuff on Family Search that is scanned. Um, of course, you again don't know the validity of this research that these people are putting on there, but you can use them as hints. Um, so you might find a completely scanned genealogy of your family, and somebody wrote out, you know, what their birth, marriage, and death records or dates were. But then you'd want to go through and kind of check their work with actual resources. So go go and find that marriage record, go and find that birth record, and make sure that you're doing the actual work and not just saying, oh, this is my genealogy, this person already did it. You also want to broaden your location search sometimes, um, because just because they lived in a certain area doesn't mean that they for sure stayed in that area. Or um, like if they lived in Wisconsin, doesn't mean that they got married in Wisconsin. I found plenty of my ancestors who I know lived in Wisconsin, but they got married in Illinois, or they went up to the UP and got married. You know, there was kind of destination weddings a little bit at that time as well, even though, um, you know, most of the time they did kind of marry around where they lived, for sure. And like I showed you before, you want to check out those location pages for those helpful learning center courses. They're just short little videos usually. Sometimes they're closer to an hour, um, but there's so much helpful information. And the Family Search Wiki is amazing. Um, definitely use it. I use it all the time to figure out how to research both on Family Search as well as offline. And again, for the families, family trees, you can follow a person to get a weekly notification of who has made changes. And if there's no changes to a certain person, you won't get any notification. There's a really awesome book to help with Family Search. Um, the second edition of the unofficial guide to familysearch.org um, just came out last year, so it's still pretty new. I um, have been a Family Search user for probably 15 years, and I read this book and I still learned stuff. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check it out. It's like 230 some pages, so you can read it pretty quick, um, but you'll learn a ton, definitely. If you're not familiar with how to use Family Search, or even if you are, I definitely recommend checking. The next database um, that we're going to talk about is the Passenger and Immigration, Immigration List Database, also called Ely. Um, this is one of our newest databases. This one is, um, it just came out last year, so they're still updating it and things like that. Again, they're going to ask for your library card number. So once you put that in, you're going to sign in. Mine's already signed in, thankfully. And then you're going to select the 2020 edition. As they add more editions, um, they have more listings there for you. But this is just an index. Um, so you're not going to find actual physical records here that you'll be able to download like you did on Ancestry.com or Heritage Quest or Family Search. These are just indexes. Um, so you can, of course, put a name up here. And then it will give you a listing of the person that you're looking for and multiple listings sometimes of the same person. Um, so you definitely want to click on them and, and see what kind of information they have. So this, of course, is my Mayflower ancestor. So there's a lot on him. Um, but usually it just gives you like when, when they arrived, where they arrived, um, who else they might have arrived with. And then the main part of Ely is the sources. So these are all books that contain my ancestor in it. So you might be saying, well, how do I even find these books? Because these books aren't digitized down here. Well, you could definitely check all the traditional um, places that are, have digitized books like Family Search, um, there's Hopkins Trust, there's archive.org, Google Books. Um, another thing that you can do 
is um, what you would do is you would take the um, name of the book. I'm trying to find a book. Some of these are like journals. You take the title of the book and Healy always wants you to highlight it for some reason. Um, and then you'd go to what's called WorldCat. Um, so WorldCat, if you're not familiar, it's also a link in your handout. This is the world catalog of libraries. So this catalogs a lot of the libraries around the world. And so what you do is you put a title of a book in here or the name of an author and you'd search it. You'd make sure, oh, that's the right author with the Peely. Um, and then once you click on it, it will tell you what libraries near you have this book. So this one apparently is only in Oklahoma, which is 700 some miles away. Unless you feel like a road trip right now, might not be an option for you to check out that book right now. But what you can do is we have interlibrary loan, which some libraries will loan the book for you for a couple weeks. Um, over here, it also gives you links where you might be able to buy it. Sometimes it's fairly cheap. Um, but if you aren't completely sure that it's your ancestor, another thing you can do is you can reach out to the library that has it and see if they'll give you a scan of the pages that your ancestor is in. Um, so like I've done this with German books that it's like the St. Louis Library has and that's the, the closest that, that, that has this book. And you know, if you usually send them a, a small donation and are really thankful and um, kind when you ask for your request, they, they will get back to you and, and send you those pages and it's really helpful. Um, then you don't even have to leave your house. So again, um, the main point of Peely is just connecting you to these resources, um, which you would have to find then offline. I do have a couple search strategies. Um, again, like I said, it's just an index, so you're not gonna find actual records, but it will lead you to all their sources. And again, these are some of the, the common places that you might find it digitized, you never know. Um, it's definitely worth a quick search to see. Um, you can even, even Google the title of the book and see if it's been digitized. Um, this is also a super new database, like I said, so just be patient with it and check back as they add more records. And it's of course just on immigration records, it's not any other kinds of records. Now we have a ton of newspaper databases that we can talk about. Um, the first one that's a user created one, or not a user created one, an APL created one is the obituary index. Um, so a lot of libraries, ours included, have an obituary index of our local newspaper. So our obituary index only includes the Appleton newspapers. Um, and this database, it will show you right down here what years we have complete. It's still an ongoing project. And it tells you a little bit more about the index and how to request copies of it. Um, so you can search by name, maiden name, date, a date range, things like that. Um, or you can search by a complete name or just a surname. And then over here is where you would um, look at the details. So um, you would see birth and death date, um, what newspaper was found in. Um, so if you are close to the Appleton Library, you would be able to look at this um, newspaper on that page and see this obituary. If you're not, um, or of course, since we're closed right now, you'd be able to view the details and then request a copy of this obituary. So I definitely encourage you to check out other libraries that might have um, a similar index and reach out to them to see if they provide copies of the obituaries. Otherwise, um, you might be able to use the obituary index and then some of our newspaper subscriptions to find actual copies of that obituary that have been digitized. And again, you don't need a library card for this one or the Post Crescent Index. Um, the Post Crescent Index is also one that we've created. And this is more um, local news and community events, information from the schools, um, other cultural activities and um, local companies, statewide things that have happened that have been published in the Post Crescent. Um, so we have different subjects and things. Um, like you could type in Appleton Chair Company and see, is that one of the, the listings? Um, and what articles have been written about the Appleton Chair Company? So it's just giving you a headline, the date, 
it should give you a page number. For some reason, that one does not, unfortunately. Um, but this one does. So again, you'd look at the microfilm and be able to find an article. Um, so it was really helpful, like if your ancestor owned a business or was part of an organization that was really prominent in the area. Um, also, if they were a really prominent person themselves, they might have been written about in the newspaper and in the index. And then um, we have newspaper archive. So you need to create an account with newspaper archive. Um, right now, we only have the Wisconsin newspapers for the Wisconsin for newspaper archive. Um, it is a worldwide site. Um, so some libraries maybe near you might subscribe to a worldwide version or have more United States coverage, um, but for right now we only have uh, Wisconsin newspapers because it's kind of an expensive database. Um, so to get there, you just click on this Wisconsin Newspaper Archive. You type in your library card number, which I'm going to pause again just quickly to type in my library card number. And once you hit submit, it's going to ask you, um, you can register for an account down here, or if you already have an account, um, put in your, your email address and your password for your account, and then sign in. And see, like, it, it makes you think at first, like, oh, we have United States coverage, but we don't. If you try to click on Minnesota, it says, sorry. Um, so you would only click on Wisconsin, unfortunately. Um, over here, this is if you want to search just all of the Wisconsin newspapers. If you know specifically your ancestor lived in one of these cities, you might want to um, narrow it down to the city, and then you could do a search. Um, so, and down here it will show you what newspapers and what date coverage um, that they have. But be aware that sometimes that date is really um, a big number. But like if you look at the Post Crescent, um, there's only like three issues of certain years or there's a big gap in years. Um, but once you find a, a result, um, you would just click on the name of the newspaper and then it would pull up an actual image of the newspaper for you. And there's lots of fun little things that you can do at the top, like save it, email it to yourself, print it. Um, you can clip out just the area of the newspaper uh, you can zoom in, zoom out, change the pages, whatever you need to do. This is loading a little bit slow for me tonight. But as you can see, it usually gives you like a little box of where um, in that page your ancestor's name is or whatever you searched for. Um, you don't have to search by a name. Um, you could definitely search by date and then browse through the different issues. Uh, also, like I said, if your ancestor like owned a certain business or were part of a certain organization, you could search that name as well under the keyword part. Since this is taking forever, we're just going to go back out. Come on. Well, we've gotten pretty lucky with technology so far. <laughs> All right, it's just not going to work for me tonight, I guess. Let's go back to the main part of it. All right. Well, I guess Newspaper Archive is not going to let me do stuff today. Um, we will maybe try a little bit um, towards the end again and see if it works. Um, or if you have more specific questions about how to use it, you can definitely reach out to me and I can help um, you navigate it a little bit more. Uh, the next newspaper database that we have is newspapers.com library edition, um, which you don't need a library card to access if you live in Wisconsin because it's uh, part of the Badger link resources, so that's a statewide listing of resources that give you, they give you for free. So you click on go to this resource. And then right away, you can either search by a keyword or a name. Um, you could also see the newspapers by location. 
Um, this is a worldwide um, subscription to the newspapers.com. Uh, if you know the name of the specific newspaper that you're looking for, you could also click on papers and um, search for, for a specific name. So like if we want to look at just the Appleton one, it will give you like this is Appleton, Missouri, that's Appleton, Kansas. This is unfortunately the only Appleton, Wisconsin one that they have right now. And like I said, kind of for newspaper archive, like it gives you this really long listing of, oh, it goes from 1859 to 1974, yay. But no, look, there's only 1500 pages. And if you actually click on it, it will show you um, the dates that they have coverage for over here under this browse by date. Um, once it loads completely, So like see for 1859 of August, it only has two issues. And then the next thing that it might have is like one issue or there might be no issues here. Um, so it's, it's kind of spotty coverage depending on what you're looking for. This might be only a weekly newspaper at this point too. Um, you can either search by the date or um, like if you know your ancestor you want to search your ancestor's name in that specific newspaper you could do that and then again over here is all the the functions where you can zoom in zoom out um, change the contrast rotate the image things like that um, one cool thing is you can do a clipping um, but you need to register with your email use facebook or with ancestry.com and then you just draw a box around it and it will give you a pdf that lists um, the title of the newspaper, the date, the page, and then it gives you a little snapshot of that article. You can also print and save it or share it or save it to your ancestry.com. So I can show you a search really quick. So typically, again, like I said, I, I use the quote mark um, just to make sure that it searches that name together instead of all the instances of Richard and all the instances of Warren. You want to again start broad. Of course, I don't want to go through 31,000 results. Um, but over here on the left hand side, that's where you can narrow stuff down. So, say your ancestor only lived from 1800 to 1900. You could click that. Or, like if you know you're looking just for their obituary and they died in 1960, you could just put 1960. Or if you know specifically they died in September of 1960, put September of 1960. If you're looking for a specific date, even more specific than that, you can even write September 1st, 1960, and it will give you just that date. Um, you can also narrow it down over here. You could even narrow it down by location. And if you hover over the states, it will say how many matches are in each of the states. The darker the state is, the, the higher the matches there is for that person. Um, one other cool thing that they do, that they just recently added, is even if you click on the state, it will then, allow you to also narrow it down by county. So say you know that they lived in Milwaukee County. Well, you don't want to go through all 47 matches when you know there's only five in Milwaukee County. Then again, from here, you'd click on the image and it would bring you to the actual image of the newspaper. Um, the other thing that newspapers.com is doing um, is breaking down obituaries and marriage um, notices. Um, so for this person, there isn't any in that specific time, but if I cut out some of the search parameters, this gives me a Richard Grubbs from Richmond, Virginia, um, and his obituary. Um, so you could click on that and then send it to yourself. Again, same with the marriages, that um, there are notices of marriages between people. So it's really helpful that it, um, they're trying to kind of do the work for you and, and narrow down what information you're looking for um, to get your ancestor. Um, I also wanted to encourage you to see the Find Your Ancestors reporting from November um, because she talked about the Archive of Wisconsin Newspapers, which is another database that we have um, that's open to Wisconsin residents only and you don't need your library card to use. It has both historic newspapers as well as more current ones. A lot of um, like the smaller towns in Wisconsin are covered in that one. And she also talked about Chronicling America, which is a na uh, nationwide database that you also don't need your library card for. Um, but she went more in depth about how to search in Chronicling America 
as well as how to use the newspaper directory, which is something I use all of the time. Um, basically, if you don't know what newspapers were in a certain area at a certain time that your ancestor might be in, you can look by state and by county and by city and by date to find out, okay, these are the newspapers from 1960 that were published in Appleton, Wisconsin, and see, okay, where do I get these newspapers? What libraries have this newspaper or where can I find it digitized? Um, so it will point you to those resources in order to find your ancestor in a specific time and place. Um, so again, the YouTube link is in the handout in order to find that um, specific recording. So search strategies for newspapers, again, you want to use a quotation mark um, around a certain name if you want it together. Um, what's really nice about newspapers.com is that um, even if there is an initial between John and Smith, like say it's John E. Smith, it will search John E. Smith too with just you putting John Smith in there. You don't need to put the E, but I do encourage you to try to do that as well. Um, Note that not all the sites support that wildcard searching that we've talked about with newspapers, or not newspapers.com, family search and ancestry.com, where you can put in the star or the question mark. Um, for example, Chronicling America does not have wildcard searching, but newspapers.com does. So try it on all the different sites and see if it works, see if it doesn't. One thing that newspapers.com also has is the Boolean operators. So that's using the words and, or, or not. So say you're looking for John Smith, but you don't want a John Smith that's in Michigan, but you want a John Smith that's anywhere else but Michigan. So you can put John Smith, not Michigan. Um, so it will give you all results that have John Smith, but don't have the word Michigan. Or say you found a John Smith that's married to a Mary, but you're looking for a John Smith who's married to a Melissa. You can put John Smith and Melissa, not Mary or whatever. Um, you also want to look and see if there's an advanced search. That might be an option um, for you to help narrow down uh, the results if you have a lot of the results, especially if you have a more common name for an ancestor. You also want to try to search multiple ways because um, newspapers, of course, had misspellings. Um, you might want to try putting just the last name only because uh, sometimes, like for females, they didn't list their first name. They went by Mrs. Husband's name. Um, Sometimes even for the males, they listed their first name as an initial, or they had their first and middle initial, so like F.A. Schwartz, instead of Frank Abbott Schwartz or Frank A. Schwartz. Another trick um, is you could try searching with their children's name, or a sibling's name, or a parent's name. Um, sometimes I've gotten lucky and found obituaries that way when I have tried multiple other searches and did not find them any other way other than by searching by a child's name or a sibling's name. So you never know, it's worth a shot to try it. Um, again, you wanna to try to filter the time and place to narrow down your results, um, especially if you know specifically where they are. Um, of course, not all, did, not all newspapers have been digitized, so keep checking back often to see what else has been added. And also don't narrow it down just to the obituaries or just the marriages, even though that is an option in, in newspapers.com. There's lots of social news, there's wedding announcements, uh, people celebrating a special anniversary, like a golden anniversary, um, even just your ancestor going to visit somebody. I mean, that's pretty cool to have that information in a newspaper. I recently found um, my great grandfather's school where he went to because he was written about in the paper for getting 100% on his spelling test. And nobody else in the family knew what school he went to other than me finding this little mention in the newspaper that he got 100% on his spelling test at that school. So lots of really awesome information that you can find in newspapers. If all else fails and you think, hey, for sure, I know that they have the, the, an obituary and you're still not finding them no matter how many search ways you try, browse page by page. Um, it's really easy to, to narrow down what newspaper you want, what date you want, and then just go page by page and scroll through quick and see if you can spot a name. It might just be a little mention or it might be a huge long article. Um, and definitely make sure you're finding the complete article when you find it, because sometimes, um, especially with the older newspapers, they have like part of the article up here, and then the other part's like way down over here. So make sure you're reading the newspaper article as you're clipping it and making sure that you're getting all of it. 
Also, um, a really great site that I have in your handout, no library card needed, it's a public site, is the Ancestor Hunt. Um, so this is an awesome site for worldwide. Um, they have listings state by state, as well as county by county, um, different ethnic uh, newspapers. So there's summary pages for all of these states. Um, there are kind of a lot of like pop-up ads and stuff that kind of come in this site, because of course they have to pay for the site somehow. Um, but it's really helpful to, like I said, there's a pop-up. Um, once you get kind of out of those ads, it will show you listings. Like these are all the newspapers that are on Chronicling America. These are the newspapers that are on Google News Archives. These are the ones that are on the Archive of Wisconsin newspaper site. Um, and then breaking it down, these are certain ones that are on library websites or museum websites or other historical websites. Um, so this kind of helps solve the work of, okay, I know I'm looking for my ancestor in an Algoma newspaper. Where are the Algoma newspapers? I don't want to check 100 sites. I want to check this one, and then it will show you exactly where those Algoma sites are. So that's, again, a link that's in your handout and a really helpful site. We're nearing the end, I promise. <laughs> All right, um, one of the other ones that we have is the Veterans Grave Registration. Um, this is just a, a Wisconsin Appleton area one. Um, so this is a database of uh, Fox River Valley veterans from the War of 1812 to World War I. And this is um, their grave registration information. One thing I wanted to know before we go into it is it's not actual historic documents. These were records that were created later on. Um, so you definitely want to go through and verify the information that you find in this site or this database um, because it was created not at the time of World War XII or the War of 1812 or the Civil War. It was created afterwards. So I'll show you quick what one of them looks like. This is one of my ancestors. You pull up just this image and it has like his information where his last address was, um, what unit he was in in the Civil War, um, when he enlisted, when he was discharged, when he died, where he's buried, there's all this information, who his next of kin was, um, all this awesome stuff. So again, you'd want to go through and confirm all this information because it was created after he died. Um, but still, it's helpful stuff to point you if you don't know anything about your veteran ancestor. We also have a plant map index um, for Outagamey County on our website. So these are the, the plant maps that are part of the index. So 1889, 1910, 1917, and 1942. Um, so again, you'd um, type in a last name and a first name if you'd like, um, and it will show you what plat they're on, what section, what range, township, page, and then what plat. And then to get to that plat, you would just click on this image or this link, um, and then you'd find whatever one they were on. I'm just gonna pick this one at random. And then you could click a PDF of it, and it will show you, like these are the names. Um, and then you would zoom in or zoom out. You could save this page, things like that. Uh, on the different ones um, and get to that. One thing I want to note about this is um, it's an index only and it's really hard to read some of them. Um, so another different thing that you could do when you're searching this database is not even put a name in. Um, and I can show you, it will show you all the hundreds and thousands of results that we have. But you can see like there's question marks in here because we couldn't figure out what letter that was where the question marks are, or we might not be sure that it's for sure John. Um, so what you can do is you can just hit search and it will come up with all the listings and it might be easier for you just to go through and say, okay, are any of my ancestors here? Cause there's only however many pages. So that's a neat little trick. Yeah. And again, no library card is needed. It's just on our website. Appleton Memory Project is also where we've been putting a bunch of digitized things. Um, we have copies of some of our city directories on here. We have photos of all the mayors. 
Um, we have a couple of cool pamphlets that we've digitized from um, the city or things about library and the schools, and tourism. Um, so those are all links here. One really important one is the Pioneers of Outagamie County where they have lots of awesome biographical sketches of a lot of the early settlers. Um, so your ancestor might be in there. So definitely encourage you to check that one out. We also have Fox Valley Memory, which is another, um, it was our older, our first um, digitized material site. So we have a lot of images on here um, of like different buildings, different historic areas, historic people, um, sometimes historic homes. And then a really great part is the text area where they have um, the Ryan's history of Outagamie County and a bunch of digital collections that you can connect to, including um, city directories, historic sites, the first hundred years of the county, lots of historical information on here. Again, no library card needed, it's just on our website. And then the University of Wisconsin Digital Collections. Um, so each of the area libraries has like a little page on here, which has tons of information. So these are uh, where you'd also find our directories, our plant maps are on here again um, to link to that. Um, lots of other things. Um, county histories, the Appleton Review. You can search um, specifically in these if you click on it. So this will search just within that work. Um, or if you want to search all over here, you'd go over here. I did also want to let you know that this is just the Appleton one, but this is a whole statewide collection that this is a part of. So you really want to go to browse and then you'll see all the different collections there are. Each of these has hundreds and thousands of information um, on all different areas of the state. So definitely encourage you to check out this site. Um, you'll find a lot of historic information on some of the pioneers and even some of the more recent people. Rec Collection Wisconsin is also a really great statewide resource um, that has a lot of digitized content. They have a lot of like oral history interviews, photos, lots of other different projects they have going on. So again, you can search the collection here. Um, you can look at certain projects they have, browse by subject, format, um, whatever partner you're looking for, things like that. I also wanted to encourage you to check out local historical societies and genealogical societies, um, checking out libraries in the area where you're researching. So remember that there could be local libraries, there could be county level libraries, there could be state level libraries, and even regional libraries. Um, so one thing, if you don't know the names of the libraries in that area, is you could use Google Maps. Um, so I have an example here, use Google Maps, and you can search in Google Maps, libraries near, and then put the city and the state. Um, so I just did Peoria, Illinois for an example. So when you search libraries near Peoria, Illinois in Google Maps, it will give you a little map of all these area libraries. So you can see which are the closest ones to your area. Um, again, these are you know part of a countywide system. So you wanna go to their websites probably or give them a call and see who has the historic information. Because usually if it's like a county system, there's one library in the system who has all the historic stuff. You could also Google um, certain things, like if you're looking for a certain county, look for their historical society or their genealogy society. There's also a really great resource in the Wisconsin State Genealogical Site. Um, so that's another link as they have county by county pages where they list out all the different libraries in that county, all of the different, um, historical societies, all the different genealogy societies. So again, county by county, you just pick what county you're looking for. Um, they even have other historic information, like these are all the cemeteries listed in Brown County. Um, here's a link to the Bay Area Genealogical Society. Here's how you would contact them. Um, here's the different historical societies, the different libraries, um, other cool links of digitized collections that they have, museums, maps, other different resources. Um, so these are all free. You don't need to be a member of the Genealogical Society, but I do encourage you to. Um, they have an awesome resource of webinars that they do every month um, and lots of other really great resources to connect you to your ancestors in Wisconsin. Finally, I want to talk to you a little bit more about Find Your Ancestors. Um, so Find Your Ancestors is a series on genealogy that we do every winter. 
Um, so usually from November to March, about once a month, we have a speaker come in and talk about a different topic every month. Sometimes like this month, we're gonna have two speakers. Um, so you can check out our events calendar for exact dates and to register. I also have links in your handout to register for our upcoming one. And um, you could also check out our Facebook page, Appleton Public Library, where we have our events listed, um, where you can register for those. And again, sign up for our email list and we send out events on there as well. You can check out our YouTube channel for our past recordings of Find Your Ancestors. These are a sampling of some of the ones that we had um, earlier this year, as well as last year and even in 2019. Um, so we had some religious records, finding immigrant ancestors, things like that. They're all up there free for you to watch. No library card needed. Just go to our YouTube page and we have a Find Your Ancestors playlist. And even if you're interested in um, researching the history of your house, we have a house history program that we did last September. And again, these are the upcoming topics that we have um, for the next few months. So I definitely encourage you to check those out. And um, regardless of if you're new to researching or if you've been researching for a really long time, you're always learn something new. I know I continually am learning something new from our awesome speakers. We have speakers locally as well as speakers from all over the world, um, all over the country. So that's the uh, one silver lining of the pandemic is that we've been able to get some really awesome speakers uh, virtually right now. And they're all held via Zoom. So if I didn't give you enough information or if you need a little bit more help one-on-one, -on -one, you can always book a one-on-one -on -one with me. Typically we do it in person, but of course with the pandemic, we're right now on hold with that. Um, but I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one -on -one over Zoom or if you just wanna send me an email and say, I'm stuck and I have no clue what to do. I can definitely help you walk through any specific questions you might have. Um, like if you have a genealogy brick wall or you're just not sure what specific resources you might wanna to try to tackle your research problem, just let me know and I am happy to help. Or I can tell you a little bit more about how to use some specific databases that we have. And that is all folks. So if you have any questions, I'm gonna check the chat box. Again, my email address is on there, it's on the handout um, and the reference desk number is there. So I'm gonna stop screen share and I'm finally gonna say hi and check out the chat and see what kind of questions we have. All right, how can you look for non-US military members such as the Netherlands? So Goal 3 does have um, non-US records. Um, I think Ancestry does and definitely FamilySearch does too. FamilySearch is a worldwide site. Um, so you could either start by location or search the name um, and then narrow down that way. Um, let's see, if you type Richard Warren, will that search also bring up those with middle initial or just those without? Um, it depends on the database. Um, I would, again, try different ways. So if you know their middle initial or if you don't know their middle initial, um, try different ways. Um, so try like, you know, a, an initial for the first name, an initial for the middle name, the last name, try just the last name. There's lots of different search ways that you can try to try to bring up your ancestor. Or you can even try just looking for a date um, if that's all you know. Can you talk more about Hathi Trust? Hathi Trust um, is like a digitized library. Um, so they usually get a bunch of different materials from different libraries, uh, like the University of Wisconsin is, is a big one that um, has Hathi Trust material on there. Um, so the library borrows it to Hathi Trust and they digitize it and they put it online. Sometimes they have a bunch of different restrictions on it, like only UW-Madison students can use this, or you can only search um, in it but you can't look at the actual image. Um, so it really depends on the individual institution who's borrowing it to Hathi Trust and what kind of restrictions they have on it. Um, so sometimes you might only be able to see a preview of what the digitized thing is, but you know, you can also use WorldCat in order to find any local libraries that might have that. Or if only that one library has it, you could reach out to them and say, hey, I know my ancestor's on page 276. Can I get a scan of that? And most libraries are super happy to help you out with that. Oh, thanks. I'm glad to hear somebody enjoy the presentation. They applied for a library card. Awesome. Well, if anybody else has any other questions, I'm happy to, to hang out and answer any. And again, feel free to email me. 
I'm going to post the, the chat link again if anybody came late. All right, there's the handout link one more time. Yeah, thanks everyone. I'm, I'm sure I threw a lot of information out of you, but hopefully you learned a little bit of something. And like I said, if you need help with any of the specific databases, I'm happy to do more one-on-one. -on -one, or if you want me to do like a whole session on family search, I'm happy to do that too. I can talk about any of this, these databases for an hour or more. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of all of them. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good night.